This is going to be a rant video. A rant video about the worst mechanic that has ever been introduced to Magic the Gathering's competitive or blackboarded non-joke formats. And somehow, somehow in the last couple of years they did something worse than Day Night, which deserves its own video because of how fucking bad it is. In today's video I'm going to talk about stickers. A mechanic that came to us in Unfinity, one of the unsets that for some reason put real cards, non-joke cards, into real Magic formats. That's right, I'm using the word real. I know Wizards of the Coast don't like referring to the unsets as not real, but let's be honest, they aren't real. But just like your sleep paralysis demon who isn't real, they can still hurt you. I recently played some goblins on the channel and I really enjoyed it. I've played goblins quite a bit in the past, both in paper and physical, and I've played a lot of mono red prison, both physical and paper. Both those decks kind of combine into the modern version of goblins where you're playing prison pieces and goblin payoffs, whether that be aggressive rattle masters or big old muxies to go and get lots of goblins out of your deck. This this deck utilizes Blank Goblin, or Name Sticker Goblin, or Guacamole Goblin, or Mind Goblin. The, one of the first problems with this is that this particular creature that has a blank in its name that you put a sticker in to fill the gap means that this card is both hard to write down, hard to search for, and hard to come to a conclusion about what the fuck we should call it. This mechanic has so many problems with it, it's hard to fit them all in to a concise video without my blood pressure rising and my balls exploding with frustration. Once I've wiped the spit off on my chin and I've stopped shitting myself with passion, here is Mind Goblin. This is the culprit. This is the one that actually showed up in competitive play. I'm gonna unpack all of this. What the card does, how it sees playing Legacy and Pauper, why or, well, the conjecture as to why these cards are even legal considering they're in one of the unsets, the historically joke sets. And on top of all that, how the mechanic is just more frustrating than it already sounds once you start to unpack it. But first I need to pay my mortgage and childcare costs, so here's a message from today's sponsor. I don't know if you noticed, but Mother's Day is fast approaching, so why not give your mother some peace and quiet, a respite from your incessant whining with Raycon Everyday Earbuds. Look at this mother. She's pretending to be on a phone just to avoid talking to Timmy here. If only Timmy would shut the fuck up. So whether you got a mum who's a rocking granny, or maybe your mother just likes books, audio books, why not help your mother ignore the responsibilities of her life and her little sprogs today with Raycon? I use Raycon Everyday Earbuds to listen to Horace Heresy novels whilst I paint little plastic war barbies, because I'm the coolest nerd you know. I wish I could say I do this every day, but unfortunately I have to uh, make videos for you lot at home, for the entertainment of strangers on the internet. The Raycons have 8 hours of playtime and 32 hours of battery life and a swish charging case to store them in too. I'm always surprised by how strong the noise isolation on such a compact little earbud is. And the optimised gel tips create a really comfortable fit, so I forget I'm wearing the headphones whether I'm down in the gym, or when I'm painting, or whether I'm taking walks and listening to audiobooks. So whether you're looking to impress your mother this Mother's Day, and if you're talking to your mum by the way, say hello for me. Or you're looking for discreet and comfortable headphones to listen to podcasts or audiobooks on when painting or down the gym. You can click the link in the description below or go to buyraycon.com forward slash Kenobi. They wouldn't let me have milk. To get 20% off your earbuds and free shipping today. You can support the channel today by going to that's buyraycon.com forward slash Kenobi because they wouldn't let me have milk. 20% off and you get free shipping, baby. Link in the description below. No, what's going to happen? Because it works differently on Magic Online. <laughs> it does. <laughs> All right, I'm just, I don't know what happens. All right. I'm going to play uh, Blank Goblin, which is known as Name Sticker Goblin. Oh, no. Oh. In the circles that I roll in. So. Uh, but when this creature enters the battlefield, you may put a name sticker on it. I understand I have a sticker sheet. Doesn't mean I understand what the hell it is. So you get uh, to so. take a, don't you, it, don't you love stickers? So. Stickers! I get to look at, I, I don't know. What is happening? <laughs> You get to peel a sticker. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm supposed to have one sticker sheet or a million? What's it I, say? I have a sheet here. You have a sticker it sheet. It says so trained, blessed mind. There's a little zap icon. There's, there's a, only there's one a, choice. Gandalf staff. Where there's did a, you get the stickers a from? Red ball. They come from box? the sticker sheet. This is how stickers work. Come on. This was, and this was, the decision was made to not keep this Unset only, but that this is okay to go into Legacy Popper. It's legacy playable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Play legacy. I, ser yeah. I seriously feel like yeah. I'm blacking out right now. <laughs> what is going on? Where did these stickers come from? Bring at least 10 unique sticker sheets. No repeat sheets. That's cheats! So this is Seething Song, it just wastes everyone's time. I seriously cannot believe what's happening. I feel like 
Like this is a this is I'm being punked basically. <laughs> that I got brought out here. I have a, I have a story. To he has tell a, you a after book of stickers for his card. <laughs> The original unsets were silver bordered. Traditionally, what silver bordered meant was they were available to be played in these old joke sets, but they weren't legal in black bordered magic. That's every other form of magic, from commander through to legacy through to standard. These cards were never legal in any of it. The unsets range from cards that cause you to do dances and sing, as if playing Magic the Gathering in a public space wasn't embarrassing enough. Cards that fundamentally broke the, the rhythm of the game or the rules of the game in a way that was quirky and kind of interesting as a one-off. Or they did something so fundamentally different and interesting they ended up getting printed into Black Border. That's so rare that we've got like one example of it. The cheese stand alone is quite literally Baron Glory from Time Spiral or Future Sight. If we're honest, the unsets were painfully unfunny and they were only really interesting from a novelty perspective of playing magic in a novel way. That novelty often wore thin quite quickly, although I would have to say that as time went on, the unsets got better in terms of representing a absurd sort of comedy world like we saw with the latest one with Infinity, much funnier than Knights of the Oki Pokey and all the, quite frankly, crap we got in the early unsets. These sets notoriously and historically did not do very well. There was a period where I'd find unhinged boosters just randomly in stores years later, at a discount sometimes, and you'd buy them because they came with full art lands. They think that was unheard of. Fast forward to the modern day though, and unlands or full art lands are available everywhere. Zendikar introduced them to black bordered sets, and now you can't scratch your ass without a full art land falling out of your crack. So how the hell are you gonna sell these unfunny unsets now? Well, I guess you can stick some shock lands in the packs. That's not enough though, is it? Because the shock lands probably won't shift the packs, especially if you're using shock lands to sell other products. How about we put cards in them that are actually playable? In Commander, for example. The main reason that a lot of Infinity cards were legal in Commander was so that, well, they were legal in Commander, they would sell packs because people would want them for the Commander decks. The offset of that is that Commander shares its legality with other formats like Legacy. So that means that these cards that are now illegal for Commander are now also legal for Legacy. This means the set has to be paid attention to the people who want to play Legacy or Commander, at least in the way that they have to understand that these cards might show up in a game or they might entice them to play with them. And I didn't hate this completely in the same way that I quite liked when they had a period, a trial period, where all the legendaries from um, the set before Infinity were legal temporarily in Paper Magic. People were playing with all the stupid novelty named cards from Unstable is, is the best of a bad bunch because it has a load of mechanically interesting cards and even has a precursor to mutate in it. Baron Von Kallen is a good example of an interesting legendary from the set that I was not unhappy for people to be able to play in our Commander games at a table at my local store. But then they were removed from the card pool and we came to the next on set where they did this thing where they did a different type of hologram. So basically if, this, if the card had no hologram at the bottom, it was legal in all formats. If it had a normal Normal hologram at the bottom, it was legal in all formats. If it had the acorn symbol, it was not legal in normal formats. If this sounds a little bit confusing and you're wondering if you're a bit simple, if you can't understand it, don't worry. Wizards of the Coast fucked it up multiple times across previous season, revealing the same card with different symbols on the frame. And thus, it was a confusing mess as to what was making it into eternal legal formats and what wasn't. Even wizards were confused. This set is so messy. This is an interesting and weird situation where I look back at the old unsets like Unsanctioned or whatever. The, is this Unsanctioned? Unstable? I can't keep up. The names are too similar. But Unstable? And I'm like, oh, wait, were these cards legal? No, 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 they weren't legal. But they were used in the old, the old foil treatment thing at the bottom, which it, it's not like annoying or confusing at the time, but it's annoying in hindsight. Anyway, I don't want this video to turn into how all the unsets suck and how like fucking Infinity was one of the worst magic sets of all time, which it was. It's arguably the worst magic set of all time. And that's a whole video in itself. Either way, acorns are not legal and non-acorns are legal. And thus, the most dangerous gamer is legal in Legacy. It's just not very good, so we don't see any play. And thus, Mind Goblin slash Namesticker Goblin slash Blank Goblin slash Guacamole Goblin. I'm just gonna do Mind Goblin for the rest of this video, but I just wanna highlight how stupid the naming convention of this is. This became legal in both Pauper and Legacy. Foils of this are like 15 bucks, you know. But Vince, I hear you ask, can you explain why it's good? Okay, let's talk about the, how the sticker mechanic works. When this creature enters a battlefield, you may put a name sticker on it and add red for each unique vowel on that sticker. So in essence, the goblin enters the battlefield and triggers, and then you need to choose a sticker. How do you choose a sticker? Well, you bring 10 of these at the beginning of the game and you randomize three of them when you start by presenting them prior to shuffling up and presenting your deck. And then whenever you were to sticker something in the future, you'd put a sticker from it onto that card. Name and art stickers are free. In this case, any of the name stickers you put on the goblin would cost you nothing. Meanwhile, the actual theory mechanical altering things like power and toughness would cost you tickets and some cards generate tickets. 
this has largely been absolutely useless in contemporary Eternal Force like Legacy. It's only been the name goblin that's really had any sort of impact. And thus, there's like 40 plus ticker sheets and you can bring 10, but ultimately it, it basically works out to that when you bring the correct stickers and you pick out the best ones, you've got a 100% chance of getting four mana or upwards. So it's always a three mana two two that makes four mana. To source a wonderful article on Ultimate Guard's website by Frank Carsten, everyone's resident magic mathematician, if you bring the correct sticker composition, you have a 30% chance of making six mana, a 40.8% chance of making five mana, and a 29.2% chance of making four mana. And thus, this is a weird seething song style creature that you need to cut. Hold up, hold up, I made a mistake there. You don't need to cast it. The reason I made a mistake there is because the card doesn't work the same in digital as to what it does in paper. Here comes issue number one of many, many issues with this fucking mechanic. Because stickers and contraptions were initially designed to not be good enough, that their rate just wouldn't be good enough to see Eternal play, I'll come back to that for our second point. This card here was never planned to go onto Modo. None of it went onto a Modo. All the mechanics were so weird and quirky, none of this shit could show up on Magic the Gathering Online. However, this card started seeing play in Legacy and Pauper, which primarily live on Magic the Gathering Online. They are essentially digital formats for the most part, if we're honest about it. But because these cards started to see play, because you could mind Goblin out off of a lackey and then put a Muxus into play 40% of the time or whatever it is, people were like, please put it on Modo. And the poor shepherds, the poor development team of Magic the Gathering Online, a lot of developers left with a spaghetti code mess that has been just piled upon and piled upon. An absolute heaving pile of nonsense that they chaperone and guide to be remotely playable. They did their magic. They added Mind Goblin to the client. They just had to add it as a not completely different card, but a significantly different card. Name Sticker Goblin, as it's called on Magic the Gathering Online, says when this creature enters a battlefield from anywhere other than the graveyard or exile, if it's on the battlefield and you control nine or fewer creatures named Name Sticker Goblin, you may roll a 20 sided dice. That means you can still put it off lackey, but you can't reanimate it or like free spell it from exile in some way, like with the upcoming plot mechanic. There's a lot of different ways that that could have gone horribly wrong. They decided to remove some of that functionality for a reason. And then you have a one to six dice roll gives you four mana. A seven to 14 dice roll gives you five mana. And a 15 to 20 dice roll gives you six mana in an attempt to emulate the percentage chances that you get through the arbitrary uh, result of stickers, the abstraction of the sticker mechanic to raw numbers. However, I'm no mathematician, but as far as I understand it, these percentages don't quite match up. The online digital sticker goblin is meant to be a percentage or two out, just for the very nature of how D20 corresponds to the, 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 the three percentile types. This is what I've read. I can't quantify it because I'm a fucking idiot. And thus, name sticker goblin is now playable online in a much cleaner and simpler way. ETB, trigger, is it still alive? Roller dice. Get that man. Now, the whole being on the battlefield as it resolves thing is on purpose because that allows you then not... In paper, if you were to put the sticker goblin to play and go to sticker it and they kill it in response, the sticker doesn't land. The trigger resolves and the sticker went onto it and thus you don't get any mana from it. That means they had to add that extra clause there. But as far as I understand it, the not from Exile or Graveyard essentially just makes the card function slightly differently. I don't understand why. I assume it's some sort of complication around tech, but I don't have the answer for you. Okay, so now we have some parity between physical and paper, right? Well, yes, but there are other considerations for paper, which I'll come to. Now, let's go back to that point around how these were designed to never really impact legacy. That does demand and beg the fucking question, why even bother making them legal then? It's because of Commander, right? It's because of the need to sell this stuff and also have someone want to buy it. And that will be Commander players. The idea of tearing Commander legality away from legacy legality doesn't sit well with me because it's nice that the cards, the, the sets or formats share a card pool. That magic isn't like infinitely complex. That's some point we just draw a line and say it's the legacy card pool with a different ban list. But at this point we got to a point where some people want the sticker stuff banned just to simplify fucking paper magic for some reasons I'm about to come to. If these were never tested in eternal formats, why put them into eternal formats? Like why even bother? Why run the risk? And to clarify, I'm not making up how good this is. Goblins, is, according to Goldfish, is in the top five meta decks in the entire format. Name sticker goblin is pushing goblins to be very, very good 
mode in a Turbo Mux style. Magic is already adding a million and one cards all the fucking time. So I guess there's an argument that a little bit more weight on top of that with the unsets isn't so bad. And I also agree with the sentiment that Legacy and formats like Legacy that are played by percentage wise a small portion of the Magic community primarily online and by the most franchised players that shouldn't hold game design to ransom. However, having different formats where legalities can be different means that you could probably partition things off and have things like this not affect things like Legacy. But also on top of all of that, the way this affects Legacy is perhaps a good indication that it never should have touched any Black Border format, if I'm honest. So, sit down to a game of Legacy and you're meant to present a sticker deck to your opponent if you're playing sticker cards. Which means if you don't present the sticker deck at the beginning of a game of Legacy, you are giving away information. You're telling your opponent that you're not on goblins, which you might think is a minimal edge, but it's still an edge nonetheless, right? Meanwhile, me presenting the sticker deck would arguably tell you that I'm on goblins. You start playing, you keep a hand that's good against goblins because you're assuming they're on mind goblin because none of the other cards see play. And they untap and they play a basic planes into Aether Vile. They're playing D&T. You've been got, you've been bluffed. In some ways, I think this is wonderful. This is a Reddit post that brought this idea to my attention that someone is bringing the sticker deck to bluff goblins. But when you start to think about it beyond the initial quirkiness and like funny situation in which this puts you in, it does make sense that you should bring a sticker deck to all legacy tournament games because you want to get an edge. In essence, if you present a sticker deck, you are implying that you could be on goblins. If you don't present a sticker deck, you're telling your opponent you're not on goblins. There is an extra rule where if you were to create a card that makes a sticker without having a sticker deck available, they can be randomly generated via the online web resource. This is part of like the rules document, which is fucking crazy. I don't really know if this works at Compare Yell because having to go to a website to generate something is strange. The example of this would be if you were to clone your opponent's mind goblin. If you steal the mind goblin with a Ragavan, not in Megacy because Ragavan is bad, but if you were to steal a Mind Goblin with Ragavan, you don't actually get to sticker it because stickers specify you can't sticker a card you don't own. That's right, there's some more baggage where they try to avoid this shit. But if you Frexian Metamorph this in Legacy or Vintage because you're playing Metamorph in your mud deck perhaps, mud's not really an archetype, but just bear with me, then you now own the Mind Goblin because, or name sticker goblin, or whatever the fuck we're calling it. Oh God, I hate this card so much. But you you are now owning that card and thus can sticker it, and thus you generate a sticker sheet. Or you might wanna have brought the sticker sheet in case this situation came up to make sure you always get the four, five, and six mana that we talked about earlier, if you have the optimum composition of sticker sheets. If you randomize it, you could get a higher percentage of three manas, for example, which is, why would you do that? Why would you not A, not give your opponent information upon sitting down and bluff that you might be on goblins when you're not, and B, in a situation where one of your clones or something suddenly makes a mind goblin, why would you not maximize the amount of mana you can get out of that? And thus, we are now in a situation where, in theory, and in practicality in many senses, you should always bring a sticker deck with you to play the most optimum game of Legacy. And thus, a stupid fucking mechanic from a stupid fucking joke set that should never have been legal in Black Border Magic now presents you with a situation where everyone is playing Legacy so optimally because no fucking cunt can be bothered to bring sticker decks alongside their deck. I think stickers is kind of offensive on multiple levels. Not only does it have no respect for the idea of eternal organized tournament play like Legacy, but it also feels just incredibly cute for the sake of being cute. I am all for exploring new design space, but some of this exploration is perhaps exploration for the sake of exploration. I think at some point you have to stop when designing a new mechanic and wonder if the complexity it brings is worth it. I really like pushing boundaries, but there are points where I'm just like, is it worth pushing this boundary? You've really got to weigh up like how much fun and interesting space does this give players in terms of gameplay, gameplay agency and skill expression compared to how much of a mess it adds on to Magic as a game that is already complicated when it comes to formats like Commander or Legacy where the entirety of a huge card pool is available. This outside influence, this inclusion of an extra deck is something that Magic doesn't currently have or didn't have up until very recently and the addition of these kinds of mechanics. Now, Wow. Some of you might be saying, isn't that like an initiative, which I, um, uh, you might have seen me on Shuffle and Play, arguing that initiative is a fun mechanic that's quite easy to track in Commander. And I'd say it is. I'd say it is adding extra elements outside of the game, the dungeon mechanic, the initiative mechanic, and so on. I think initiative is better than dungeon for the fact that it encourages you to attack each other, so it works in a multiplayer format a lot better. But when it comes to initiative specifically, compared to, say, end of the dungeon, 
Initiative enters one singular dungeon, which is not a separate card or deck that you need to represent. Coming to that more in a second. Stickers you have to present before the game, so it adds another layer of dumbness to the whole proceedings. Initiative, in many ways, can be represented by an infinite token where you write one, two, three, four, and five, and you check against a reference card, your phone, or whatever to tell you what the initiative steps are, or you just both remember them if you play a lot of Legacy. I play a reasonable amount of Legacy and a deck that depends upon the initiative in Commander, and I can't even remember all the steps. I probably could if I tried. I'm not going to. That would be embarrassing if I got it wrong. My point is, it is an external factor, an emblem if you will, that is modal or, or transitional between steps. That's how I see it. It's an emblem in the exile zone. It doesn't need extra permanents that come from an extra deck that can't move to the graveyard like attractions can, or in the case of stickers, it's not an extra deck you have to represent and show your opponent prior to starting to play, and then you have to put tokens or counters onto things that move between zones. That's another point. We should probably clarify that too. The sticker mechanic has some extra baggage to it that I missed earlier on. These stickers are basically counters that represent extra things like a plus one plus one counter or a death touch counter but instead they represent succinct bespoke information to its particular sticker because they're stickers uh, there's an argument that mark rosenwater makes that this is information they can load into the counter itself because you're sticking onto the card however that brings all sorts of logistical issues around will these stickers remain sticky forever I can guarantee they won't. I think at present time, the average sticker sheet is still sticky, but I haven't tried to use a sticker sheet for two or three or four years of magic and then come back to see if it's sticky. I'd hazard a guess that it's not. But then you can make your own sticker sheets. Sure, like you do with tokens and counters in a way, but tokens and counters can often be represented by simply dice or objects that are easily uh, perceivable as tappable. Infinity tokens, for example. Stickers, you can do that with by writing onto an infinity token and putting it under the card saying this one is mined, but then you also have to represent game objects that have all three stickers written on them. For example, cards that you've written them, things on, shuffled up and, 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 and displayed somewhere in your deck box that you can get out and represent to your opponent, and then shuffle up and present to your opponent once you present the three random ones. And you see what I mean? It's already fucking annoying me that I've got to explain that there's two parts to it. You either have all the sticker sheets themselves, which creates an extra a baggage of shit you've got to carry, or you create your own ones in capacities that aren't doable via basic dice without an elaborate dice game. Here's Collins Mullen showing up for a Legacy 2K and showing this picture on Twitter back in March. That's right, he's gone to the trouble of creating, you know, reusable sticker cards. The top shows some printed stickers on sleeved up um, daylight flip cards, and then down here we've got sleeves that have each of the stickers on them that you can then, they're, they're triple out of sleeves, you can slide over the card to show what is on the card. If your eyes are glazing over or rolling in the back of your head, if you feel bile in the back of your throat, if your pancreas is suddenly in pain, yes, you are having a toxic reaction to a mechanic that adds so much nonsense to the game of magic that at the time it was received badly, and I'm still fucking annoyed now. In essence, I wanted to play Goblins in Paper. I wanted to put the deck together to play in some legacy events in Amsterdam, for example, that's coming up, and I'm just not going to. I don't want to do any of this. I don't want to sticker sticker cards to my to my magic card i don't want to buy a magic card that i've already got a source from magic card market and then either create the sticker cards or source sticker cards from magic card market or similar retailer in europe i don't want that extra baggage it's already annoying enough that stores don't have the sheer amount of stuff that might get printed to go into commander decks and eternal decks right now let alone having 10 supplementary cards if not more arguably because there's 45 of the fucking things but 10 of them you gotta purchase as well. At least the dungeon is only three, and even then, arguably, you don't need them. You can write numbers on an infinite token and reference a dungeon on your phone, for example, where in this, you still have to randomize the fucking things and present them to your opponent. But to go back to the initiative for a moment, I think the initiative brings a positive thing to magic. The initiative is powerful and fun to go through and resolve over and over in a game of Commander. And whilst there's a lot of text on an extra card that comes in from elsewhere, I do, I do agree and appreciate that that is baggage to the game of magic it is just one implementation of it the initiative gets you this or it proceeds you in a previous dungeon if you're already in a dungeon from the dungeon mechanic which is baggage that i dislike strongly but the key thing about the initiative mechanic is that it pushes multiplayer games to cause attacking because when you attack on an opponent you get the initiative off, the, off them when you cause combat damage and it facilitates the fetching of lands for example helping some players in a multiplayer environment work together to say oh go on hit me go get that basic land and it facilitates the game moving people are Attacking, game actions are being taken, the game is progressing towards an end. In essence, the initiative brings something to multiplayer magic that is a positive thing for multiplayer magic. What does stickers bring to magic? There is an argument 
that stickers give some players a deck to play with. Ambassador Blorpity Blorp Blorp is a five mana three three. When it ends the battlefield, you get some tickets and then you may put a sticker on a non land permanent you own. At the beginning of each combat, you may have Ambassador Blorpity Blorp's base power and toughness become equal to the total power and toughness of all stickers on permanents you control. This card is fine, except for the fact that it's already got a million words of text on it that then refer to tickets that are spent to get stickers, which is a whole separate mechanic on separate sheets of cards, up to 10 outside of the game. Having flipped cards or cards refer to dungeons adds a million and one bits of text to them. In this case, it adds a million and one bits of text to them to a randomized deck you also bring with you. I'm sorry, the baggage is too much. I dislike that strongly. But arguably, someone somewhere is playing Ambassador Blop, -a -blop, -blop right? So, it gave them a deck, I guess. It doesn't really improve the multiplayer environment for everyone involved, like I would argue the initiative does. It just adds a load of baggage to one area of the game so someone can play a sticker deck if it resonates with them. Meanwhile, the most playable sticker card in all of Magic in Eternal formats, which is sticker or name sticker goblin, should I say, this card works the fucking same or close to if you just roll a fucking dice. It brings nothing to constructed magic beyond it being a new space for someone to play in. It doesn't improve the overall feel of magic, like I would argue at the shift does at a floor four player table. Furthermore, it's shit in limited. People complain that the stickers didn't stick properly even during their drafting fresh out of the pack. I avoided drafting this card rather shoot myself in the dick, but I'm going to take that anecdotal thing as just another mark against this because I'm very biased. I think this mechanic is dog shit. On top of that, it's shit for chaos drafting. Like, with Unstable, if you include an Unstable pack in your average Chaos Draft, there's still some fun to be had. And there is still some fun to be had with Infinity. There are cards that still work in a, a Chaos Draft environment. But much like the morphing creatures from um, Unstable, the attraction and sticker cards from Infinity just don't really do a whole lot outside of their respected limited environments. A good mechanic for being non-parasitic in a Chaos Draft or Cube environment is something like Outlast. Outlast is a mechanic that often people say is bad because you don't want to spend time tapping your creature resources speed. There are issues with Outlast. But ultimately, a lot of the Outlast cards, like Abzan Valkana, for example, just has an inherent um, synergy with other counters' creatures. Meanwhile, the sticker creature doesn't make a sticker itself. You've got to have a sticker sheet that you're meant to draft. I think you're meant to draft the sticker sheets. Oh, fuck me. It boggles the fucking mind that any of this shit was legal in the first place in Black Border Magic. In real magic. The unsets really were... A load of shit. I'm sorry. I am not a fan. And I've got less of a fan as I got older. I've got less time and energy as an old man to put up with this shit. And I also just really draw the line when we're having to shuffle up 10 extra cards in a supplementary deck that has stickers attached to them to present randomly to our opponent at the beginning of the game in the eventuality that I might clone one of their mind goblins. Or at the very least, to not reveal what deck I am or am not on at the beginning of a game of Legacy. And more specifically, I now don't want to play goblins because I don't want to deal with this shit. And that, my friends, is stickers. Uh, but attractions are kind of as bad, but none of the cards are playable. How long that lasts for, I don't know. That's me on stickers. I hate them, and I kind of both love Mind Goblin for what it allows you to do in the Goblin's deck and Legacy, which is fun, but I fucking hate the idea of having to resolve or play with it in paper. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. I hope you've enjoyed this rant, and I'll see you in the next one. Ta-ta for now.